I'm going to review um, oncological emergencies. You had this in Med Surge 1, but I'll give it a little review for you um, because it's going to be on exam 3. So the first condition I'm going to talk about is an obstructive emergency, and it's, it's um, superior vena cava syndrome. So what happens is usually somebody has like a tumor in their chest, so, and it presses on the SVC. And, you know, our bodies are amazing. So if something is pressing on the SVC, what the SVC does is it's going to make all these collateral vessels. Let me see if I have a picture. Yes. So it will start to make all these collateral vessels, okay, that will help, you know, because the SVC drains the blood from that, you know, upper body and head into the heart. So it's going to make all these collateral vessels. And that's why you see people with SVC can you see all these veins on their chest? Okay, so you'll see that. So it usually happens with lung cancer and lymphomas. So there's obstruction of blood flow to the head, neck, and upper back. Okay, and they're typically, I don't know if you can see it here on this video, but you can see he has rubber here, right? He's red above the neck. Uh, you know, it almost looks like he's not pale until right about here. So typically you see that maybe like redness, nipples, and up with somebody with SVC syndrome. Okay, so they can present with dyspnea, which is alarming. They can have um, dilated chest veins, which we talked about, and distension. So they get um, edematous in their upper, upper body. Okay, so... Um, they could end up with hoarseness and dysphagia. So the common symptoms are going to be edema of the arms and hands, dyspnea and cough, um, erythema of the upper body, that's what I was alluding to earlier, epitaxis, so nose bleeding, distension um, of the veins of the head, neck, and chest. Um, they could hemorrhage, they could have mental status changes, and they could have hypotension. So early sign is increase in neck a circumference and tightness of the collar and periorbital edema. So the treatment for this is um, they're going to put the patient may get like um, adjunct treatment like he needs a stint put in to help that chemotherapy they would get that radiation uh, corticosteroids to reduce the edema and of course you would put your your patient if they were having trouble breathing you would put your patient in semi or high fillers, whatever's most uncomfortable, give them some oxygen, make sure you're on top of the steroids, and then uh, remove all their jewelry. So to recap, okay, SVC syndrome occurs to people who have uh, lymphoma or lung cancer, something in the thorax, okay? And the, oh, here's the tumor right here. So the tumor is pressing on the SVC. So over time, this SVC is going to make all these collateral vessels, and you can see them, you know, you can see them on people. They have dilated veins. Um, the signs and symptoms include shortness of breath, neck, face swelling, swelling of the hands, the upper extremities. Um, so they're going to need an emergency stint, um, some radiotherapy, which means radiation treatment, and then also possibly some um, steroids. And um, you want to make sure you remove all the jewelry because their neck can, it can swell. So make sure you take all jewelry off and put the head of the bed up. Okay, the next oncological uh, emergency I'm going to talk about is spinal cord compression. And this happens to people who have mets to the spine. So what happens is, is the cancer invades the epidural space, which if you look at right here, Okay, it could be, you know, the cancer has broken this spinal bone down and this is leaking out or it's a tumor, an epidural tumor pressing on the nerves. So what you would see in your patients, okay, is that you would see neurodeficits. But you, typically the patient is going to complain of low back pain for six weeks before they have neurological deficits. So it's really important that you recognize it early because what you do does matter, because if they develop the neurodeficits, they may not be able to get their, um, you know, previous functions back, okay? So that's why it's so important to catch this earlier. So you're going to monitor for back pain and the neurodeficits. So typically, 
it would be like they would suddenly be incontinent or they would have numbness and tingling or they would have trouble walking that have muscle weakness all right so if you have a patient that is complaining that has cancer and is complaining of back pain do a really good neuro assessment um, of course you want to get all your ducks in the row before you call the provider so make sure you do that so we can get on top of it and hopefully the patient won't have any further or any neuro deficits if you're on top of it and they can get treatment right away all right another obstructive emergency is pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade so like patients with breast cancer um, can develop this and it results from invasion of cancer cells into the pericardial sac now good for you you've already learned about pericardial effusion so essentially it's the same treatment the same signs, signs and symptoms so the patient's going to be short of breath they're going to have orthopenia meaning they can't lie flat they're going to be uncomfortable breathing they'll complain of left-sided um, chest pain with breathing they're going to be tachycardic and have a narrow pulse pressure now you're going to be looking you're going to worry about them having cardiac tamponade if they have a pericardial infusion so you have to look for the triad so hypotension JVD muffled heart sounds and also pulseless paradoxus a paradoxal pulse that means a systolic blood pressure decreases by 10 millimeters of mercury on inspiration so that's a, those important signs and symptoms because what you're essentially going to have to do if you see these signs and symptoms you're going to immediately call the provider or if the patient is in distress obviously a rapid but the patient is going to need to have an immediate uh, pericardiocentesis or uh, and they may put a drain in in this okay to drain out the fluid um, or the patient could go to the OR and get like a pericardial window um, cardiothoracic surgery and make like a little window looking thing in here so that the fluid could leak out all right SIADH so <clears throat> tumor cells can mimic SIADH or ADH I should say um, or they can stimulate the posterior pituitary discrete ADH also some chemo agents can contribute to ADH production so whatever whatever it is okay ADH is going to SIADH is going to be SIADH whether it's from chemotherapy tumor cells brain injury it's all the same thing okay so essentially what happens is SIADH the patient is going to hold on to fluid okay and because they hold on to fluid all right so it's antidiuretic hormone because they hold on to fluid their sodium level is going to go low so a lot of the signs and symptoms you're going to see is because the sodium level is low like muscle cramping anorexia fatigue um, loss of their thirst because they have so much fluid on board right um, they could be irritable confused now with low sodium we worry about um, seizures so they're going to need to go on seizure precautions um, but like when it gets 115 I start to really worry when it's 110 you really got to worry so low sodium is what you're worried about with SIADH now the urine is has a high specific gravity and that's kind of important to know um, SIADH um, increases water absorption in the distal tubule only water absorption not all the solutes which the solutes go into the urine that's why they have a high specific gravity all right so it's treated on um, patients usually you know they have to go on a fluid restriction and it can be anywhere from you know 800 to 1200 to 1500 um, a day but um, you're going to liberalize salt in the diet you're going to use normal saline if like say the patient has an NG tube instead of using water to flush you use normal saline to flush um, they may need chemo radiation you know treat whatever's causing it in other words they may need IV fluids for osmine. now this Vaptin medication Talvaptin is an uh, ADH antagonist so it is going to allow for diuresis without electrolyte imbalances so this is a medication they would use to combat SIADH and then if they are having seizures phenytonin um, and then your nursing implications INOs daily weights fluid restriction 
um, and monitor the sodium because cor correcting it too rapidly may cause seizures and death, but you definitely don't want it to go too low either. Okay, so give the medications as ordered. All right, tumor lysis syndrome. So tumor lysis syndrome, it's kind of a good thing in a way, but also you have to head it off. So let me tell you what happens. So a patient has a tumor and they get chemotherapy. And tumor lysis syndrome really indicates that the tumor is breaking up. So it's kind of a good thing, right? You just have to be looking out for um, the breakdown of the cells and the sequela of that. Okay, so you need to like always think about the timing because I'm going to be talking about a couple of conditions that happen in a certain length of time. So with tumor lysis syndrome, this is going to happen about two to five days after treatment. And that's an important distinction. All right. So what happens with tumor lysis syndrome is the cells start to lyse. When cells lyse, they're going to release potassium. So that's going to be your first sign, high potassium. They're also going to release uric acid. They're going to release, and this can cause an acute kidney injury, okay? When, when it releases uric acid, they're going to have high potassium and high phosphorus because that's also leaked from the cell. And they'll have a low calcium level, okay? So you got to watch out for all these electrolyte disorders. All right, the lab work. The potassium is going to be high. The phosphorus is going to be high. The calcium is going to be low. They'll have a high BUN and creatinine, and, and a high uric acid can lead to an intrarenal AKI, so above 6.5 of uric acid. I would focus on the length of time, too, like when it happens. That's really important. So the signs and symptoms are mostly due to the high potassium, okay? So look at your EKG for the peak T waves, the widened QRS, the prolonged PR interval, which we call first-degree block bradycardia, and asystole, and death. Okay, so we want to stop it early. Um, they're going to have um, lethargy, muscle weakness, cramps, and they could have seizures. All right, so they're going to need lots of fluids to flush everything out. Um, they would get IV hydration, so usually normal saline is a good flushing fluid. They're going to get a medication called raspuricase, and raspuricase is going to hopefully prevent or change the uric acid from leaking out of the cell. It's going to change it into something else that's not going to hurt the kidneys. Um, they can also get alpurinol plus IV hydration. That's another option. And then, of course, you're going to monitor all the labs. So that's your job with tumor lysis syndrome. Now, when I go, what I'm going to talk about next, okay, is sepsis. Now, people with cancer usually get sepsis after they have chemotherapy and they become neutropenic. Now, every chemotherapy agent is going to have a different nadar. Nadar means when the cells are low, okay? A general rule for you is 9 to 14 days post-chemo. And if you can remember, tumor lysis can be one to two to five days, okay? So there's kind of a big gap there, right? So if you have somebody that's presenting and they're nine to 14 days post-chemo, think sepsis. If you have somebody that's presenting and they just had their chemo within five days, think tumor lysis syndrome, okay? That's an important distinction for you to know. So neutropenia is going to place the patient at risk for septic shock and DIC. So your neutropenia labs is an absolute neutrophil count less than 1,000 or a WBC less than 2,000. So people that get, and you know sepsis, right? We, we've talked about that a lot this semester. So with, um, with DIC, because DIC can happen due to the sepsis, okay? They have excessive clotting and excessive bleeding. Remember, students are good with excessive bleeding. They're not good with the clotting. So you have to remember when people are throwing those microthrombi, they're going to have impaired organ perfusion. They're going to have end organ damage and ischemia. And I talked about the brain. I talked about the kidneys. that will be a nerve. They could have a kidney injury, right? Um, the heart. They could have an MI. So remember that with the clotting. Um, so, oh yeah, here it is again. 
All right, so with occlusion of the blood vessels and decreased blood flow to major organ, you're gonna organ. Sorry, you're gonna assess for the pain. Like if somebody um, throws a clot to like their uh, large intestine, right? They're gonna have like a lot of pain there. Okay, so abdominal pain. Um, if they have the stroke syndromes, they have a clot in their brain. Uh, anuria, they have a clot in their kidney. All right, and they'll have a kidney injury. Um, cyanosis, if they, especially if it's like one hand or the hands and feet, that could mean there's a clot um, somewhere disrupting that blood flow. Now, your signs and symptoms of bleeding, I think you, you're good with that. I mean, we talk about this a lot. Um, and then your interventions. Okay, first, let me talk about the labs because you're going to have to know this. So, in DIC, the fibrin split products, which are also called fibrin degradation products, are going to be elevated. Okay, and the reason they're elevated is because they, they come about because fibrogen is being broken down. And fibrogen is going to be decreased because the body is using up all the fibrogen. Um, the platelet count is going to be decreased. The PT and PT are going to be prolonged or elevated, whichever way you like to you know, think of it. INR is going to be elevated. Thrombin time is going to be elevated. And they will have a positive D-dimer. All right, so your interventions, make sure you're identifying sepsis early. So increase heart rate, increase respiratory rate. You really got to count them. Narrow pulse pressure. Okay. Using strict uh, aseptic technique on everything you need to. All right. So the treatment is going to be chiros precipitate clotting factors when DIC progresses or FFP, RBCs and platelets and heparin to prevent the rap rapid consumption of circulating clotting factors. Okay. So it seems counterintuitive to give heparin to somebody in DIC, but you've got to break that excessive clotting and bleeding um, like um, cycle they're in, okay? Um, and so make sure you know the labs, make sure you know the signs and symptoms of bleeding and the signs and symptoms of clotting. All right, now here we go again. I'm going to talk about the oncological emergencies. SBC usually happens to people with lymphomas and lung cancers. Oh, here's a good picture. Here's the cancer in the chest, right, pressing on the SBC. So it results in obstruction of blood flow to the head, neck, and upper trunk. You're going to see um, they start to make all these collateral blood vessels, and that's why you see them with these veins in the upper body. Okay, so they divert around the tumor. Here's another picture of it. Um, they're going to have edema in the face. Stoke signs usually, it, it, Stoke signs refers to somebody has a shirt and they try to button it and they can no longer button it. That's what that means. So increase in neck circumference. Okay, and so headache, uh, bloody noses. What you're most concerned about is bleeding. So hemorrhaging and hypotension, cyanosis, and seizures. All right, so the treatment is going to be chemotherapy, radiation, stint placement, and corticosteroids. Get your patient up, the head of the bed up, and remove all jewelry. And here's just a pit. They'll do a stint in interventional radiology so that the blood can be, you know, start flowing better. All right, spinal cord compression um, can happen with patients with breast cancer, colon cancer. You don't really need to know the different types of cancer that they get. But what you do need to know that is if somebody does have cancer, okay, um, and they start complaining about low back pain, that's something that really needs to be investigated early. Because once they start to have neurological deficits, there's no going back. Okay, so we have to stay ahead of it. You know, even if they're in stage four cancer, you still want them to have a good quality of life um, at the end. So I do want to point out that multiple myeloma is a type of cancer where you expect bone pain. Um, you expect a Benz Johnson protein in the urine, high uric acid, and high calcium. All right, so that's an important distinction because they may get this too. Um, and look for your... Um, 
loss of bladder or neurogenic bladder, okay, bowel incontinence, so like new findings, okay, muscle weakness, numbness, and tingling. Your interventions, they're going to get corticosteroids, pain management. If you can walk them, you can try it, but it, they may be in too much pain. Chemo, fixing whatever is caught, what kind of cancer is causing it. Um, and they may wear one of these braces for comfort. And you know with spinal cord injury, we log roll. Okay, pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. So cancer cells evade the pericardial sac, and there's a buildup of fluid. So your patient is going to be short of breath. They're going to be um, have complaint of pain on the left side with, with breathing. They um, are going to have a high white count. You're looking for cardiac tamponade. So you're looking for hypotension, JVD, muffled heart sounds, pulses, paradoxes, okay? Um, um, so look for those signs and symptoms, okay? A friction rub that goes away. That's another sign of cardiac tamponade. So they're going to do either a pericardial window or a pericardiosynthesis, where they just take the fluid out. Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, it doesn't matter how, how they get there. It's all going to be treated the same. So you're looking for, a, you'll see, I should say, a low sodium level. When it gets really low, we worry about seizures, coma, death, okay? Um, they're going to have a low serum osmolarity because the kidneys are absorbing water back into the body so the patient is like soaked inside, right? They'll have anorexia, fatigue, we expect that in people with SIADH. Their urine is going to have a high specific gravity, um, and they'll be confused. So the treatment, stop free H2O, which means a fluid restriction, um, liberalized salts and food drinks in the, in the diet, they'll need INO. Um, the drug is Talvaptin, and also uh, phenytonin to um, head off seizures. Okay, hypercalcemia. Okay, this is why I was talking about multiple myeloma. They typically get multiple um, hypercalcemia. Um, so multiple myeloma, they're the ones that have the high uric acid. You expect it, Ben Johnson protein. But, uh, you know, if they develop hypercalcemia, we can treat that with fluids usually. So you can remember what happens in hypercalcemia by stones, bones, groans, psychiatric overtones. So... With stones, they're going to be prone to renal calculi. Um, they're going to be prone to pain, bone pain and fractures. With groans, they're going to be, um, you know, prone to constipation and decreased or hypoactive bowel sounds, I should say. Um, they could develop hy uh, pancreatitis from hypercalcemia, and um, they could have ulcers. Moans are for joint pain, fatigue, muscle weakness. Um, their clot, people with, um, their clotting times are going to be decreased. All right. They'll have depression, coma, confusion. So this is psychiatric overtones, lethargy, diminished DTR. So how I remember is calcium is a sedative to the body. Okay. Except when we talk about the kidney because it causes a nephrotoxic diabetes insipidus. So they have polyuria. They will have constipation. They'll have polydipsia because they're voiding a lot. Uh, and they could have a cardiac arrest. And as you know, they'll have a short QT. So your treatment for hypercalcemia is to get them up and moving if you can. And hydration, IV hydration. So a good solution would be normal saline. They can take the zoledronic acid. Remember, this can cause a uh, intrarenal AKI. They may get loop diuretics because that will help them get rid of calcium. They may need dialysis. Um, they may get steroids. Tumor lysis, th this is going to happen right after chemo, two to five days, one to five days. Just remember, it's early versus late with sepsis, okay? 
So usually people with uh, non-Hodgkin's or lymphoma or small cell are going to be at risk for tumor lysis syndrome. Okay, so they get the chemo, all the cells um, lice. It's actually a good thing. It means the treatment is effective, but we got to mitigate the side effects of all those cells leaking potassium, uric acid, and phosphorus into the bloodstream. The patient will have low calcium level. Um, so this can lead to a UKI, AKI, so watch out for the high BUN and creatinine. Um, they'll have a high potassium, and it's important to monitor labs. So your signs and symptoms are going to be related to the potassium. So think about weakness, flank pain, nausea, lethargy, vomiting, and anorexia. Look for those signs on the EKG, um, peak T waves, widened QRS, prolonged PR interval, bradycardia, asystole, death, um, and muscle cramps. So your interventions, you're going to flush, flush, flush. Um, so you're going to encourage um, PO fluid. They're going to be put on a low potassium, low phosphorus, low purine diet. Um, and then they could get L-purinol. They could get uh, C velomer to bind with phosphorus and bicarb to counteract the acidosis. Um, if the potassium is really high, they may get D50 and regular uh, humulin. Um, they can give also like any kind of dextrose solution with the with the humulin to get to get the um, potassium inside the cell. Now, if somebody has a high uric acid and high K and they, you know, um, they may need dialysis. So that's another thing. Rest pure case is to prevent or decrease uric acid. All right. So that is um, oncological emergencies in a nutshell.